Thank you for tuning into this message online or on podcast format. We're so glad that you're able to hear the Word of God. Uh, We'd encourage you to also uh, get into the Word of God on a regular basis on your own. There's no substitute for reading the Word of God yourself. And so we'd encourage you to download a Bible app. Uh, In addition to that, uh, if you're not part of a local church body, we'd love for you to consider being a part of Christ Community Church. Or if you're not in our area, finding a gospel-centered, uh, Bible-based church in your home area to be a part of. There's no substitute for real fellowship with the body of Christ. So we hope that you enjoy this message. We hope that it really blesses your life. And if you would like to support us financially, you can go to our website and do that as well so we can continue to spread, spread the gospel to those in the world around us. Have a great day. God bless you. Man, good morning. Guys, we made it. We made it. This is the last week of our Faith in Action series. Can somebody say Faith in Action? action. We're here, guys. Um, Just to kind of share with you from our side of the table as pastors, I want you guys to know for us, this, this past handful of weeks, the book of James has been just like a spiritual scalpel. Amen. For those of you who have been keeping up with this series, the Lord's used this text just to cut away a bunch of the things that our heart has attached itself to for life, for relief, for purpose, for meaning, so that we can grow to be disciples who have practicing faith, a faith that's rooted in Christ, that's lived out in the everyday moments of life. And hopefully this this series has been an encouragement to you. I know that for us pastorally, as we're sitting around the table, it's just been like a series of throat punches by the scripture. (laughs) Honestly, can we just talk about it? Like there's a lot of stuff that's in here that's heavy. But man, I I believe for us, the Lord has used this in profound ways in our own hearts from our side of the table. Just as a quick uh, recap, as we've looked through this book of James, his letter to believers Uh, he's outlined that those who have chosen to live a life of discipleship to Christ are people who live out of the readiness to seek out and embrace the wisdom of God in his word. These people live out that word, not just hearing it, but embracing it and walking it out in their day-to-day lives. These people live not as people of favoritism or comparison, but people of compassion and grace because of the compassion and grace that we've received from the person of Christ. From that compassion and grace, it is used as a filter for the things that we say, and it is a fuel for our faithfulness to him. And look, we know that there's so much of the book that we just didn't get to cover, so we encourage you to go read it yourself Continue to just stew over this counsel, stew over the wisdom that James writes in his book. But as James brings this letter to a close, he addresses how we as disciples, as believers, as students of Jesus are to navigate our days in the midst of difficulty. So uh, if you're able, can you stand with me? And we're going to continue this practice of just creating just... Uh, a window of space just to settle our hearts, to open ourselves, to, to hear from the word of God. Guys, the word of God, the Lord speaks to us through it. It's not just a book, but it's the voice of the Lord who hungers to connect with us in a rich and intimate way. So for us, we want to just still our hearts and open ourselves so that we can hear from the Lord. So I'm going to create a moment And then I'm going to read our focus text for today. James 5, starting in verse 7, says, Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Do not grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets 
who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or earth or anything else. All you need is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you'll be condemned. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain in the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops. Father, as you seal up all of this teaching that James has given to those who are his readers and that we benefit millennia later, Lord, we pray that we receive this encouragement to move in such a way that's different than the world in the face of difficulty. Father, be our source of life when there are other cheaper counterfeits in this world. God, I pray that you, you enable us, cross an eye as we present today, just with a spirit of compassion and care as we handle sensitive topics today. And that our hearts are drawn in our attention to focus on you and draw life from you and draw healing from you. To believe that you desire to give it to us. God, we trust you. Be with us here. Dwell with us here in this place in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can be seated. As we begin today, I wanted us to reflect on something that will give us some ground, um, some footing as we engage this topic of conversation. When you look at Jesus's ministry, he is consistently displaying the inbreaking of the kingdom of God, the breaking in of God's rule in this world. And he does this not only through words, but in deeds. It is the topic that he speaks on most in his earthly ministry. In fact, it was some of the first language that comes off of his lips when he enters the scene. Repent, the kingdom of God is near. Not only is this proclamation made, but it's also joined with displays of the kingdom, healing, transformation, liberation, joy, peace, wholeness, resurrection, life. And even, even as I'm talking, for you guys who know the word and know the stories, you might have images popping into your mind of these events. Blind people seeing, demon people released, tax collectors reforming their ways, and Lazarus coming out of the tomb into new life. The disciples who followed Jesus as teacher at that time got to see this inbreaking of the kingdom of God firsthand. They got to watch their teacher bring this about, knowing that it was more than just words, but it was real. They were challenged not only to live with this kingdom reality in their hearts, but they were challenged to walk through the world as if God's imminent rule in this world is true. Can we just acknowledge that there's a lot of beauty when you start looking at the kingdom of God? Amen? Oh my gosh. It is a rich picture, a rich vision for the world of healing and life. But for those disciples, as well as us, now we are caught in this in-between space. We are caught in this in-between space knowing that what Jesus brought is true, but it is yet to come to complete fruition with the return of Jesus Christ. We are caught in this already but not yet period of time. And in this in-between space, we can look around and easily see parts of the world, parts of our hearts that don't look like the kingdom of God, amen? 
Can we be honest? There are things in this world. Bailey said it at the top of the service. Man, I looked at the news. And this world is messed up a little bit. Amen? If, we, if we're honest, if we look in the mirror and we look in our own soul, we'll be like, oh, there's some messed up stuff in there. Instead of seeing healing and freedom and peace and wholeness, we can look around in our world and we can see sickness and death and structures of oppression, war, divisiveness, people whose souls are fragmented because of the trauma they underwent. To say it differently, we see suffering. Amen? We see suffering. I'm looking at a room full of people right now. And I can say with certainty that we have all experienced or have been exposed to some type of suffering. Being in Christ, knowing what comes with him, with the inbreaking of the rule of God in our world, knowing that the enemy's time is ticking down to an end and the kingdom of God will be inaugurated and also seeing how the world does not fully embrace God's rule yet, this can produce a dissonance within our soul. Amen? It can produce a dissonance, a kind of polarizing feeling, a deep anguish, a longing for the wrongs that we see in the world to be made right, for justice to come about, for freedom to be released. Look, this isn't, we just have to address this. This isn't something that is purely a Christian view wanting wrongs to be made right, amen? Like you can ask atheists, Buddhists, new age folks, if you ask them, hey, is the world all right? They'll be like, dude, like what did you, like are you on something right now, bro? Like (laughs) have you seen it? Like we all know that there's something deeply wrong with the world. So with suffering being an inescapable reality for all humanity, It is important for us as believers, as disciples of Jesus Christ, to hold two things in mind. First is this. As as disciples of Jesus Christ, God can use our suffering as a crucible for our character. God can use the suffering that we go through in life as a crucible for character. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the term crucible or what a crucible is. If you could pull that picture up, a crucible is a ceramic or metal container that is used to heat metals up to obscene temperatures for the purpose, for the goal of removing impurity so that purity of metal can be had. When we entrust our suffering to the Lord, although it might be costly, in the hands of the Lord, nothing is wasted. Although it might be costly, in the hands of the Lord, nothing is wasted. Dallas Willard says it this way, it is only in the heat of pain and suffering, both mental and physical, that real human character is forged. One does not develop courage without facing danger, patience without trials, wisdom without heart and brain-racking puzzles, endurance without suffering, or temperance and honesty without temptation. Our suffering as believers are not meaningless in the hands of the Lord, but are a means for our formation. Secondly, as disciples of Jesus Christ, our navigation of suffering can be one of the most powerful testimonies to God and his kingdom in our world. Amen? How we work through and move through and reside in suffering can be such a powerful testimony to those who do not know him. I heard it said that Jesus doesn't send his students to start making governments or even churches as we know them today. They instead are to establish beachheads of his person, his word, and his power in the midst of a failing and futile humanity. Our example in suffering isn't just formational for us, but it can be transformational for the people who watch us engage suffering. As we suffer, people can experience the person of God through us. So, in light of this, 
there are two questions that I hope just to explore within the text today. And the first is, with these two things true, what is the posture we as disciples are supposed to take in light of suffering? What is the practice we are to engage that will sustain us in suffering? And I believe the text addresses both of these things in this letter. So before we jump in, there's just a handful of context here. James is currently writing to believers that are scattered predominantly in a Greek environment. In the immediate context of this text that we just read, right above in in chapter 5, right before what we read, we see that the believers that he's writing to, many of them are in the midst of economical oppression and extortion because of the rich. The Christian poor were being taken advantage of, extorted, condemned, even murdered and killed at the expense of people's gluttony gluttony and self-indulgence. They were underneath the weight of suffering. They were being oppressed for somebody else's ease of life. Earlier in chapter 5, James uh, pronounces a very prophetic judgment against these rich oppressors, saying that their judgment is at hand, that the cries of the oppressed have reached the ears of the Lord. And if I'm reading from a perspective of one of these oppressed people, I'm getting gassed up. How many of us get excited when our oppressors are just like getting it? They're just like, yeah, man, you better tell them. G-O-D, we out here. He's got my back, like he's getting gassed. You can imagine, you can just, you can taste the salivation for salvation in their circumstance as you're reading it as James is just laying it out for all of these oppressors. But what does James do? Turns, he turns to the believers and he writes this. He instructs them in light of the vindication and the liberation and the kingdom of God that's gonna be coming. They are tasting it on their tongues and he turns to them and he instructs them to be patient for the Lord's coming. In verse seven, he says, be patient then. In light of this huge prophetic indictment that I've just laid out, I'm gonna turn to you and say, be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. Look, guys, this illustration would have struck to the heart of his readers, but for us, it might not bear the same weight considering where we are and how we live. We don't really wait much for, lo- for much in life, amen? We don't really wait all that often. Can we just, can we acknowledge that? We don't wait, when we're in the line for our coffee, sometimes we have an attitude. We just, When I was preparing with Cross this week, he, he brought a quote from a, a scholar that said, I love this, he says, our frantic modern society has obliterated the need for patience. And you could see it's true when we look at our supermarkets, if stuff is not in season, guess what, we fly it in. If stuff is out of stock, guess what, we buy it online. We, we look to ourselves. We are responsible for results and also the release in our life. But the farmer, on the other hand, especially in this ancient Near Eastern context, they have a deep awareness of their limitations, and they also have an embodied experience of patience in their day-to-day life. Every day, they go out plow the soil, sow the seed, ward off pests. They're on their knees, pulling weeds out of the soil, preparing all for what? All to wait, guys. All to wait for things that are outside of his control, outside of his power to accomplish. It says in the text, he waits patiently for the autumn and the spring rains. He's like, hey, I know they're going to come. I don't know when they're going to come. And here's the deal. Like, meteorology is meteorology. And we all know in New England that they could tell you one thing, but that doesn't mean it's true. They get paid to be wrong sometimes. I'm sorry. It's a shot. Come talk to me about it. But there is a waiting that happens for things that are outside of their control. They say, hey, I know the promise of autumn and spring rains are on the way. I just don't know when. All they can do is prepare. It must be said that their patience isn't passive. Guys, old boy was doing everything to prepare. 
This is an endurant faith. Endurant, doing the hard things, doing exhausting labor, all to prepare and wait. It also bears to be said that their patience isn't just in something that has no value to them. What they're waiting on is of utmost importance. It's not a casual thing. It says in the text that he's waiting for the valuable crop. Why is it valuable to him? Because he knows that in that produce is his life and livelihood. There's things on the line. Somebody say there's things on the line. There are things on the line that he's waiting for, invested in, because it directly affects him. Here, in this waiting, we see an example of what Marshall Siegel calls the humble embrace of what we do not know and cannot control from a deep, abiding trust in God that he will follow through on his promises and embrace of what is outside of our control and entrusting ourselves to God who brings about his promises in due time. James is writing to a group of folks who are clearly suffering and he instructs them like the farmer to be patient for the Lord's coming, for the kingdom of God to be brought to bear in this world. And as we continue to read, we see what fuels that patience in verse eight. It says, You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. With the same endurant and resilient faith, root yourselves in the reality that the Lord's coming is near. Somebody say the Lord is near. This hope can fuel us, ladies and gentlemen. There is so much richness in here that we can draw hope from in the midst of suffering. Obviously, his coming kingdom, where God's rule and reign will be complete in the earth, will bring hope. We look forward to the day where every tear will be wiped away, where death and sorrow and pain will be no more because the former things will be washed away. We look forward to that day, amen? We hold this in our life, but not only that, we look forward to the day where we will have renewed bodies so the things that we are enslaved by, addicted to, ailed by, will no longer affect us. We look forward to the day when we are reunited with our loved ones. We hold this in our hearts as a source of hope. We have this in front of us, like a marathon runner who, fought, who goes around that last corner seeing the flags and they pour out every ounce of their effort trying to cross the finish line. This is what we root ourselves in. This is what we stand firm in. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in the last stretch. We're in the final stretch. I've heard it said last year, and this, this phrase has just embedded itself into my mind, that today we are the closest we've ever been to the return of Jesus. We are the closest we have ever been to God breaking back in and restoring his rightful rule over creation. Having this in mind changes how we think, how we move through life, amen? Amen knowing that we are as close as we have ever been to the coming of the Lord. This reality gives our hearts resilience so we can carry out our faithful, our discipleship faithfully in the midst of suffering, knowing that every day we are closer to the kingdom of God being fully realized. But there's another source of hope within this passage, and it's buried underneath that word near. Somebody say near. Not only do we have the coming kingdom that we find hope in, but we find hope in connecting with his spirit. That nearness word, there's a word that's underneath it that that suggests deep union. And what Jesus came to give us by his Holy Spirit is a unity with his spirit. We have a faithful companion, a source of wisdom and filling in the midst of trial and suffering that we are not alone. And the spirit not only is working around us, but in us to form us into the image of Christ and work on our behalf for our good. Amen. This gives us hope that the Lord is near. 
But as we continue, we see that as we are working out our faith, the nearness of God should be a source of pause, not only hope, but of pause to us. So we are acting in a way that's consistent with the kingdom that he's working to bring about. As we continue to read, James highlights in verse 9 and verse 12 two examples of speech that do not fit the category of the coming kingdom of God, and it is speech that's divisive and speech that's deceptive. And first we see uh, divisive speech in grumbling. In verse 9 it says, Do not grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. In the midst of suffering, Isn't it all too easy for us to vent our frustrations on people that are around us? Can we talk honestly? Maybe you've experienced this in your life where you work for a tyrant of a boss who's always breathing down your neck, hurling insults at you. You're in a toxic environment that they're perpetuating. All of your staff is overworked and underpaid, and all of them are just, you just feel this amounting pressure, and you get out of your car when you get home, and you slam the car door, and the first thing that you come in is snap at your kid, snap at your wife, snap at your husband. Just from a grumbling spirit. To borrow Ronald Rollheiser's words, The pain and tension that we do not transform, we transmit. Amen? The pain and tension that we do not transform, we transmit to other people. And James knows this tendency that we can find ourselves grumbling in our spirit to the people around us causing division. And this isn't just a novel thing. This is a human condition thing. There's biblical precedent that this happens all the time. We look in the Old Testament, watch, case in point, right here. If you look in the Old Testament, the people of Israel, maybe you're new to the the Bible, and I'm just going to give you a little snapshot here. Go read it yourself. But in the Old Testament, Israel is freed from 400 years of slavery. Somebody say that's a long time. 400 years in slavery and months into their liberation. They're following Aaron and Moses, and they start grumbling in their spirit to their leadership, being like, yo, like, why are we even out here, dude? Like, you're going to bring us out here to die. At least we had, like, melon and the good stuff in the pots. I don't even know what it was. But that stew was hitting. We should just go back there. 400 years of slavery. It's crazy. That's why you're laughing, because it's crazy. 400 years of slavery, and because they're in inconvenience, they grumbled against their leadership, and it caused division. Not only does it show a lack of trust in what God was bringing about, trying to bring them to a land flowing of milk and honey, a land that can be theirs, a land that God would establish them in, they said, you know what, I have a better plan. Let's just go back. But it also sowed division in their people. The kingdom of God is not a kingdom of disunity, but a kingdom of unity. Patiently moving forward as a singular body of faith, challenged to reflect Christ in our flesh, working in obedience to what God's will and purpose is to bring about the kingdom clearly into view. And James says, grumbling has no place in the people of God. In fact, The judge is standing at the door. And as much as this can read like, hey, is Jesus kind of standing at the door being like, hey, I saw that, buddy. I wonder if there's something more to that. We love Jesus. Amen? We love him. And if he's close, how are we acting in such a way that's consistent with our love for him? How are we speaking in such a way that's consistent with what his kingdom is bringing about? The judge is at the door, and it cautions us to pay attention to the grumbling that might be leaving our lips. Another warning that James addresses is swearing rash oaths. And we see that in verse 12. Above all, brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or earth or by anything else. All you need to do is a simple yes or a no. Otherwise, you will, be con- you will be condemned. For some, it might be very confusing seeing this challenge 
especially in this chunk of scripture. But in that day, it was common practice to swear oaths in God's name or in the names of other things to express your truthfulness. But oftentimes, we would say these things to be believed and then flake out on our commitments. Setting a precedent that reveals a lack of integrity within our words as disciples of Jesus Christ. We who have chosen the path reflecting Jesus in our suffering as well as in our joy. Our integrity should never be in question. Amen? Not only should we fulfill our promises because Jesus fulfills his promises, but we should be filled with truth because Jesus was filled with truth. Amen? Both divisive speech and deceptive speech are not examples of what we are to embody and relay to the world, even in suffering. So, what's interesting about these two challenges is that it sandwiches the proper example for the body of believers. When you read this, you'll, you'll find some cool stuff in the Bible. The Bible's a cool book, amen? There's just some cool stuff in there. And the reason why you see this sandwich, two challenges, it accentuates what's in the middle. It's like a good sandwich, you know what I'm saying? If you have good bread, everything in the middle is good stuff. So we're going to talk about what's in the middle right now. James highlights after expressing these are the examples that you're not supposed to embrace in suffering. He highlights the example of how they are supposed to move through suffering. And he starts with the prophets and Job. Verse 10, brothers and sisters, as examples of patience in the face of suffering, take the, prophet, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. So first, the prophets. If you are new to the Bible, the prophets were used in the Old Testament as a mouthpiece for the Lord. And oftentimes, they had messages to the people of faith and their leaders about how their hearts have drifted away from the covenant with God. When you look at their lives, their lives were marked by suffering. Oftentimes, specifically because of the word of the Lord they came to bring. Specifically because of their faithfulness to God, they invited suffering. If you look, I was doing some study this week. If you look at Jeremiah's life, right? If you look at his life, homeboy was put in stocks. He was beaten his family turned on him, and he was thrown into a cistern. I mean, how many of us have been thrown into a well by a group of people? How many of us have woken up and there, you have people being like, hey, we don't like you, yeet, and then like, that's it. How many, that's suffering, right? That's suffering. But James calls him among the blessed because he persisted with endurant faith, knowing that he had to do what God was telling him to do because he trusted him. And he trusted God to fulfill his promises. Guys, it would be really easy to be a prophet if you gave the prophetic word and it came to fulfillment next week, amen? We'd be like, okay, yeah, this is gonna happen. Next Tuesday, whew, my goodness. Some of these guys went to the grave not seeing the fulfillment of their words. What made them continue? A reliant, endurant trust in God to fulfill his promises in their lifetime or beyond their lifetime. In the face of suffering. In the face of suffering. Another example that James highlights is Job. When you look at the book of Job, in a moment, he loses his possessions, his family, and even his own health. And you see him in scripture sitting in the dust, crying out to God, scraping boils on his flesh with a broken pottery shard, with his friends sitting around him trying to diagnose what sin he did to bring this upon him. That is a different kind of suffering. But James calls him among those who persevered. For those who know the story of Job, you might be like, ah, 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 Connie. But he grumbled, didn't he? 
Didn't he have some things to say? Didn't he whine and complain? To that, I would say this. Job did have some choice things to say to the Lord, but he said them to the Lord. Amen? The entire book is filled with Job opening up the anguish of his heart in authenticity to God, saying, God, what is happening right now? What is going on up there? Give me some bearing. But he moved in God's direction in faith, knowing that he was the only one he can go to with the anguish and suffering that was in his heart. This was long before anything was restored to him. As you read the scripture, his life was restored multiple times fold after this season of suffering. That's not promised to us. He didn't know that was coming to him. It's easier to wait if we know that something is going to be paid back to us. Amen. He didn't know. But he pursued God because he trusted in him to do the things that he would do while he did the things he knew he had to do. He trusted that his prayers weren't just bouncing off the ceiling. What an example of trust to move in the direction of God in the midst of difficulty, to persevere in suffering. James sets these two as examples in suffering. So if having an endurant patience is the posture of a disciple that we take in our suffering, what is the practice that we're supposed to engage to sustain us in suffering? I want you guys to understand, James is not telling you to just white knuckle your existence, okay? He's not just telling you just to like thug it out. He's not just saying to the body of believers suffering from rich oppression, thug life. That's not what he's saying, but he offers a lifeline that is to sustain us in the midst of suffering. And what is that lifeline? We see that it's prayer. In verse 13, it says, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Before we fully jump into this door, I just want to share with you guys a vision of how robust this life of prayer is. When we talk about prayer, oftentimes we think of just talking to God, and yes, that is a portion and an activity of prayer, but there is a deeper reality. When you look at Paul talking to the church saying, pray without ceasing, he is talking about an active openness to the life of God in our everyday moments, an expectation and attention to his leading and guiding in the minutia of life, acknowledging his presence. Brother Lawrence calls this practicing the presence of God, growing more aware of God's presence with us at all times. Somebody say at all times. He is with you at all times. Are we aware of that? Are we open to that reality as we're moving through our lives? So when James says, is anyone in trouble? He's saying, invite the presence of God into your daily existence, moving as if he's with you, asking God to change circumstances, but more so to change our hearts in the crucible of our circumstances and sustain us in the process. When James addressed those who are happy, He's identifying those who found a rich joy and rest, knowing that God fulfills his promises and living in such a way that it's true. That we can rest, that God is working for our good and on our behalf, despite what we see. That can cause joy and thanksgiving and gratitude as we celebrate God has not left us and he is working for us. Amen. He continues in verse 14, is anyone sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will make the sick person well. And the Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Here we see James highlight that suffering isn't just an external circumstance, but it can be an internal ailment, both physically and spiritually. Douglas Moo, who is a scholar in James, highlights that oil in that day, it says anointing him with oil, Oil in that day not only held a spiritual significance, signifying the presence of God, but it also had practical application as medicine, curing things from all the way from toothaches to paralysis. Isn't that wild? Look, I want that olive oil because that thing hits. 
But he says here, as he continues, this is not just like a name it and claim it faith healing thing that's happening here. Mu continues saying, the elders will come to the bedside of the sick armed with both spiritual and natural resources and with prayer and medicine, administering both in the name of the Lord and both together can be used to heal the sick. And we as people of God, as citizens of the kingdom of God, are able to enter into situations, not, with the, not only with the things that are within our control, but calling upon the power of God to have inbreakings of his Holy Spirit and his kingdom in our time. Doing the things we know we can do within our power and entrusting, like the farmer, God to do things that are in his power. Just like the farmer, it's up to the Lord how much crop comes. But we can ask, amen? We could seek him and ask in prayer, because there's power in prayer. There's power in prayer. James continues and expresses that there's another sort of freedom that happens when we pray in verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for each other that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Notice in the text, he doesn't say you will be forgiven, but you will be healed. Forgiveness comes from the Lord, but... There is a healing that can take place when we bring into the light the things that we've done in darkness. Amen? I've heard it said, the things that are hidden cannot get healed. If you've been in a recovery setting, they've said things like, you're only as sick as your secrets. In community that, pa- that practices faith, prayerful confession is an avenue that we can open up our wounds to our brothers and sisters and experience the grace of God in the flesh through them and allow that waterfall of God's grace to touch these wounded and infected parts of our soul so we can receive actual healing. The soul level healing that brings about the kingdom more fully in our heart and by extension into our world as we reflect Christ. This happens in our community groups. This happens in grief share. This happens at living free on Monday nights where we are opening our hearts to one another saying, I need healing here. And the Lord responds as we pray and we turn from our own way prayer and openness to the power and the presence of God in the midst of suffering has the ability to sustain us. And I want us to understand this. In prayer, we are joining ourselves to the living God. Talking with Cross this week, I wonder how much we just forget that reality. That when we talk to the Lord, when we open our hearts in attentiveness to him, We are connecting ourselves to the God of the universe. There is a power of life that we are accessing in prayer that we desperately need in times of suffering. Amen? There is power in prayer. Somebody say there's power in prayer. prayer. Lastly, James highlights this power in prayer. As As the worship team comes back up, he highlights Elijah was a human being, even as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. It's the God of the universe working on our behalf. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its, cru- uh, its crops. Prayer is one of the greatest mysteries of our faith. It blows our minds that the God of the universe will alter the course of history based on the prayers of his people. And this isn't something that should expand our own ego, but something that should really fill our hearts with gratitude that God would look upon us with compassion and be moved to act and respond. Amen? That, we are be, that we'll be able to participate in some of the miraculous works that he has in this world, in our time. Jesus said to his disciples, look, you see all this stuff that I'm doing? You're gonna go and do greater things. And that's not because we're more special than Jesus, but it's because the same power that rose Jesus from the grave lives in us. It all comes into fruition as we pray. And as we close I don't, I don't have any fancy words for you guys. 
I don't have any quippy alliterations. I just have two invitations for us as we close this exploration of a body of scripture, two invitations that I see from this text. One directly from the posture of the farmer, sowing and waiting for the valuable crop. Guys, the valuable crop is the kingdom coming, amen? That we are waiting for. So my first invitation is just sow the seeds of the kingdom, amen? Sow seeds in the kingdom. Today is the closest we have ever been to the Lord's return. And he's invited us to work shoulder to shoulder with him. And what the Spirit is doing in us and around us, we can sow seeds by living authentically as disciples of Jesus Christ in our world, in our families, in our neighborhoods, by our words, examples, our investments, the phone calls, the going out of the way. Each action is a seed planted with kingdom life potential that can be released in somebody else's life that people can experience the freedom and reign that comes with Jesus Christ in his kingdom. Even if we suffer, we are invited to sow seeds in the world around us. And this labor is a kingdom labor of love with hearts kept by the merciful and tender hands of Jesus Christ. And this leads us to my second invitation in light of everything that we've explored in this past handful of weeks not only sow the seeds for the kingdom, but pray, guys, pray. We started this series highlighting that we don't know where everybody stands with Jesus, but we know you stand somewhere. For those of you who have yet to embrace Jesus as Lord and Savior and teacher, I invite you to open your heart to him in faith, in relationship, living a life of prayer, allow him to give you a vision of the kingdom he's bringing about. A kingdom that you'll participate in when he returns. Some of you are in here and you're spiritually limping because of the suffering that you've endured recently. Suffering physically because of illness of body or of mind. People who are harassed by other people who won't leave you alone. Maybe you're in a toxic environment. Maybe you're oppressed by a broken world system or spiritual forces. Maybe you're grieving and you have heartbreak and loss. Maybe you're in a hard marriage or relationship or situation in work, whatever it is. Maybe you have a secret kept in your soul that's eating away at parts of you. Hear me. I invite you to pray. Open your heart to the Lord. Bring your wounds to the healer. Reveal them so you can be washed by the waterfall of his grace. Let the presence of God be a balm to your soul for the abrasions that life gives. Pray honestly. Address your real feelings. Don't fluff God up. Tell him what is in your heart. Remain unhidden in the presence of the Lord. He wants to hear you. And we're going to create a space to do that right now. As Yari plays, I would just love an opportunity to pray over the suffering people who are here. I don't want to be cavalier with your pain. I'm not saying suck it up. What I'm saying is let's go to the healer together. If you find yourself in that category of suffering, maybe with illness, maybe with grief and heartache, maybe from a situation, maybe spiritual oppression, I'm just gonna ask you to stand. Stand in this room. I'm gonna just pray a blessing over us and we're gonna experience just a time of worship through song. If you are suffering right now, I encourage you to stand and I want each of you to know that the Lord sees you, that the cries of his people have risen to his ears and he wants to hear you. He desires to be near to you. So for those who are suffering right now, Lord, we open up our hearts to you. Give us an endurant faith 
because we can't manufacture it on our own. Lord, we know that you see the broken parts of our soul, the cuts, the scars, the wounds, the pain, the exhaustion, the fatigue, the heartbreak and grief. God, you see it all. Help us, God. Have mercy. Have mercy on us as we make it through our days. God, we entrust our hearts to you. Knowing that there's healing in your presence. There is life in your spirit. Lord, fill us with the things that are true of the kingdom. So not only that we can grow in deeper relationship and connectivity with you, but Lord, so we can show other people how good you are. Lord, as we suffer, give us courage. Give us patience. Renew our trust. And help us to live as faithful disciples. Receive our suffering. Enter into our suffering that we share with you, knowing that you are a God who suffered. Meet us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and receive the blessing. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope that the service today connected with you and helped you grow in your relationship with Jesus. If you have any prayer needs or simply would like somebody to reach out or come alongside you in your faith journey, please let us know by filling out our online connect card or simply emailing us at christcommunity at cccfamily.com. If this online service has blessed you in any way and you feel led to support the ministry at Christ Community Church financially, please visit our website and consider donating so we can continue to make as many resources available as possible to reach others with the gospel of Jesus Christ. God bless.